Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. This is Haleli Azulai. I'm your leadership development strategist, and I'm excited for you to listen to this episode, which focuses all about how to make the transition into being a new leader. Now, whether you are currently a leader, a new leader, or you are preparing yourself for the day when you get that promotion and you become a leader, or maybe this is something that's already in your past and you didn't really think about it when you became a new leader, but you know the struggle very well. I think that this episode can help you no matter where you sit in any of those piles, which I think probably covers up everybody in this uh, listening audience. And my expert this episode is Dr. William Gentry, who is a senior research scientist and director at the Center for Creative Leadership. This is one of the top places for leadership development in the world. And so he is one of the people who is there not only helping lead the way with research, but also in terms of training new leaders. And he also wrote a great new book that we discuss at length in this episode, Be the Boss Everyone Wants to Work For. And as you know, I describe this podcast as a podcast for leaders who want to be the kind of leader people actually want to follow. So Bill, as he's known, and I are completely aligned. Now, you know, challenges like, okay, now you're promoted, now what do you do? How do you talk to people? What do you do with the people that you used to be friends with who are on your team now and now they report to you? The unique challenges of having to change your mindset and your skill set and your interactions with people. This is the kind of stuff that we're covering in this episode, and I know that it's going to be super actionable and useful for you. So thank you for tuning in, and here we go. So excited to be back with you today on the Talent Grow Show, and my guest is Dr. William Gentry. He is the author of a new book called Be the Boss, Everyone wants to work for, a guide for new leaders. He's a senior research scientist and a director at the Center for Creative Leadership, a top-ranked global provider of executive education that serves more than 20,000 individuals and 2,000 organizations across the public, private, nonprofit, and education sectors, including more than 80 of the Fortune 100 companies. Bill, welcome to the Talent Grow Show. Oh, this is great. I, I really appreciate you uh, having me on here and, and, uh, and talking about uh, my passion, which is about helping new leaders. Yes, and we share that passion. So I'm really yeah. excited to talk with you and get some nuggets of wisdom from your perspective and your experience. Before we get into the meat of our conversation, I would love to have you just briefly describe your professional journey. You know, where did you get started? Where have you been until today? I went to college at Emory University down in Atlanta, Georgia, and then uh, found my way into industrial organizational psychology. Didn't even know what that was uh, until my senior year. And there was this great program at the University of Georgia, and there was a major emphasis. One of the professors there, Carl Kuhner, who mentor of mine, friend of mine, he studies leadership. So I've always been interested in leadership. And, and I uh, went there for my graduate school uh, years. And it was funny, the, the final year of my graduate school, I was in an organization that I thought as an intern thought, this would be like my dream job. I thought this would be wonderful. And unfortunately, it didn't pan out that I could stay there after my internship. In fact, and, and I write about in the book and the people who know me, um, I actually failed the I guess kind of like the supervisor's test, like you have to pass a certain a certain amount of tests or like an assessment center to to be a supervisor there, and I failed it, Oops. which was uh, which is very uh, humbling to me uh, and to anybody else who would be in that position too. Uh, but you know, as one door closes, another one opens, and right around that time, there was what they called a postdoc here at the Center for Creative Leadership, and I was able to to get that position. And about a year and a half into the two year stint. Uh, they had a research position open, and I applied for it, and I got it, and uh, I haven't looked back. I've been here, and what I thought was my dream job before at that organization uh, doesn't even compare to the dream job that I have 
and have had for, I guess, 11 and a half years now. I started here in 2005. So wow. um, it's been a wonderful journey. And as I said, and as you talked about before, not only am I a researcher here, I'm also a director of a team called Leadership Insights and Analytics, where we use our data to help people understand you know, how they can better serve their leaders. And I also train a couple programs here as well, particularly ones for new leaders and those individual contributors who get promoted into leadership and those entry-level supervisors and managers out there. Wow. Great. I love that you bring sort of that triple perspective. You are immersed in the research and the science of it. And you also talk to a lot of new uh, leaders in the course of your work. And then you said that you lead a team. So I know you yourself are also uh, an organizational leader, manager, supervisor. So it's that combined perspectives that help you really understand the challenges that are involved with being a new leader. Yeah, I've really tried to concentrate my research on this new leader population since about 2010, I think. Um, so it's been a few years and I've started training them and doing the research is great. Being able to turn that research into practical, actionable content for leaders in the classroom, talking about this is what you can do and you can do it is great. But right around the time that I signed the contract to start writing this book, I became a new leader myself. And what I found out in my research and what I talk about in front of the class is totally different sometimes <laughs> than actually living it and breathing it. And it is so difficult. And as I, as I say, it's, it's the most difficult transition in many a leader's career is to go from that superstar individual contributor, that rock star who gets everything done and is really good at it. And now they have to be a leader, which is totally different. And many of us struggle and I struggle and I detail in the book times that I've struggled and I still struggle at, at certain things. So I really wanted something like this book to help people understand that they're not alone, that, that there are people out there just like them that are doing great, but there's some things that they also fall short in, especially with leadership. And here are some things you can do to improve because everybody can do this. Yeah. And I'll, I experienced the same thing when I became uh, the manager of the training department where I was working. And mm -hmm. boy, that just launches you into a whole slew of new challenges. <laughs> it yes. Is, it yeah. is. It's really hard. So I agree with you. It's humbling and it, it helps you really understand the plight of the people that you're trying to help. You know, in, in your book, you say that new leaders get a raw deal or maybe no deal at all. And you quote some pretty staggering statistics uh, like that 82% of frontline leaders are not rated as excellent in skills and capabilities as leaders. I'm reading from your book here. 80% yep. of frontline leaders are dissatisfied with the job they're doing as leaders and 70% of their senior managers agree. 40% of newly promoted leaders fail within the first 18 months and 50% of managers are labeled as incompetent, a disappointment, a wrong hire, or a complete failure by their coworkers. Oh mm -hmm. my God, right? That is yeah. just so scary. So Thank you for, for doing the work that you're doing to help these people out. And I know that your book is going to be an excellent guide. And I hope that everyone gets it. We're going to link to it in the show notes. But, it, you know, we're going we're gonna to try to get some juicy nuggets within this 30-minute podcast to help people get started. And one of the things that mm -hmm. you suggest people do right away as a new leader is to flip their script. Can you give us an overview of what you mean by that? Yeah, so that, that's kind of the red thread that runs throughout all the research and the stuff that I talk about in the book. And you remember in your individual contributor days as well, probably before you got promoted in that first leadership position, you said in your training department, I had the same sort of thing too as a researcher. As individual contributors, uh, we have, I call it a script, just like a script in a TV show, a, a movie, a, a play, whatever. It kind of tells us what we're supposed to be doing and, and it kind of describes how we're supposed to act at work. And for many of us individual contributors who are, again, rock star, golden child type type people who get the job done, that script is really, I tell people, it's like that old breakup line. It's not you, it's me. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that old breakup line, it's not you, it's me, the spotlight and the focus is on me. And as workers, as employees, as individual contributors and organizations, that's the same sort of script we have. It's not about you. It's about me. It's about my success, my everything about me, my talents, my technical skills, uh, my knowledge, uh, my, you know, Go get, go get them attitude, you know, that my motivation, me being able to come in early and stay in late and over deliver on everything, you know, that makes me successful. And it's worked for us even since we were, 
we were kids, you know, it helped us get great grades, helped us get into school, helped us get in our first job. It helps us get raises and bonuses and promotions, all of those things. And there's nothing wrong with that script, not at all. And that's the script that gets us promoted into leadership. You know, if I'm really good at my job as an individual contributor, that's how I get, that's how we pick leaders. Yes. And in that leadership role, if you stick with that script, you are probably on the likely uh, path to derailment, meaning, you know, you had all the talents to, to be this great leader, but your career will derail. It will plateau. You'll get demoted. You'll get fired early because you haven't flipped your script. And when I tell people when they step up in this new leadership position that it's not you, it's me script that got you there won't work. And you have to flip your script and the, you flip your script in terms of it's not about me anymore. It's focusing less on me and focusing more on others. It's flipping your script from me to we. And that we can be how I interact with each of my direct reports, how I interact with our team, how our team interacts with the organization. It's a totally different thing that you have to think about. But if you're able to flip your script and through the research, I, I named six key areas for leaders to flip their script in, you're going to be much better off. And in your book, you describe each of those in much greater detail with tons of stories and examples and templates and all of that. So I hope people will check it out. What are those six right now? Yeah. So your mindset, your skill set, your relationships, your do-it-all attitude, your perspective, and your focus. Again, it, it's all research-based. We, it's it, The foundation for the book is based on almost 300 new leaders that I was able to research. And it looks at what are their skill gaps? What are their challenges? What are some things that I've done in my research and the field has done in leadership research to help leaders be better? Excellent. So one of those six that I wanted to focus on here is the skill set one. And you say mm -hmm. that to flip skill sets, there are actually four important skills. And I love that you acknowledge that, you know, if you, if you look at leadership literature, and this is one of the challenges I have in my work developing leaders, you can enumerate skills that leaders need and never end. It'll never, ever end a list. Right. And it's actually very overwhelming, right? So I love yeah. that you reduce it to four key ones. And I know that that comes out of the research that are like the make or break skills, which ones and why? Just like you said, that tons of them that are out there. What I wanted to do was to see which skills does everybody, and by everybody, I mean not just these almost 300 new leaders, but what do their bosses say? What do their peers say? What do their own direct reports say? These are the essential skills you need to be successful in our organization. And at the same time, are they even good or bad at those skills? So for me, you know, if something's important, but a lot of people are very good at it, why are we focusing attention on that? What you need to be focusing on is the skills that you need to be successful where you are lacking. Mm -hmm. That's a skill gap that you can really focus on. And, you know, those skills have nothing to do with knowledge or technical savvy. And that's part of flipping your skill set. Again, what got you into this leadership position is knowledge technical savvy, knowing all the bits and pieces of, uh, for me, for instance, is being a researcher, doing all the research. As a leader, there are four skills that stand out that all these leaders need to do uh, to be successful. Everybody says you need to do them. And particularly if I look across uh, all these leaders, they were pretty lacking or ineffective in these four. Two of them I talk about specifically in the skill set chapter, and that's communication and influence. A third is leading teams, which I talk about in flipping your relationships. Mm -hmm. And a fourth is coaching and developing others, which I talk about in the flipping your do-it-all attitude. Great. It makes it, I think, more manageable, even though those are not easy, actually. <laughs> but oh, they're, because, they're right? definitely not easy. And, and the, from what we found in our research here at CCL as well, one of my colleagues, Sydney McCauley, who is just renowned in, the, um, in, in terms of, of leadership research and, and in the field, for leadership development, to stick for anything you learn about leadership development, it has to be um, uh, really tied to what your challenges are, and it has to be tied to the exact skill gaps that you are facing. These skill gaps they might be uh, they might be for middle level managers or senior level executives. We haven't really found that. This is specifically for new leaders, and that's what you know for, for to stick for these new leaders. That's exactly what they're going through. So it really speaks to the fact that, as you said, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of dozens of different things to think about. But where are new leaders really lacking? So focus on these four. Cool. And one of the challenges I know that you also describe in your book 
is this whole new challenge that a lot of leaders have when they need to flip their relationships and how they're actually now leading people that used to be their coworkers. Some of them maybe were friends, right? So that's yeah. very awkward. Yeah. And some of mm -hmm. them, maybe you just sort of, you dealt with them because you had to, but you didn't really like them. And now you're responsible for their performance too. So that's right. Yeah, that's a, those are two different, I think, very different challenges. But overall, you call it the BFF to boss relationship flip. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I know that you you shared a, an interesting story in the book. I'd love for you to share it here for our listeners, because I think stories are always a great way to learn mm -hmm. um, new lessons that apply to everyone. What I found in the research was one of the top challenges that these new leaders had before before I was uh, before they came to the programs here at CCL they had to fill out all sorts of assessments that's where I got those skill sets from their 360s we also asked them what are your top challenges that you're facing right now as a leader what are your top 3 actually and almost 60% of these new leaders said that displaying authority and going from being a peer to now being a boss. That was one of my major challenges I'm facing right now, almost 60%. So it is something that is inevitable. As you said, you know, some of these people you're, uh, you've worked alongside with them as peers. Some of them, you might've even had, you know, uh, a barbecue with them that weekend, your friends play, or your kids play soccer, all those things. Now you have to manage them. And it's something that I had to go through as well. And, and it's thinking about, you know, as, as I talked about in the book, I was working alongside with them the week before, and then they start kind of pointing the finger as soon as they found out I'm a leader and, and I want to try to set the vision and, and say what our group's about. They started pointing the finger at me like, y'all don't know what we're going through. I went, well, yes, I was. I do know what I'm going through. I was with you alongside you just a few days ago. Yeah. But when you make that shift from, from being part of the team to now leading a team, you know, all eyes are on you all the time. And it's a different sort of thing. And for me, one of my most difficult things was, how am I able to display my authority and not say, hey, do this, I'm the boss, that, that kind of authority or power. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is how am I able to do things that leaders do effectively? Uh, one of the key pieces of research we've done here at CCL is any time that you've had an effective leader, three things happen. And uh, those leaders have provided, we call it our DAC model, and I talk about it in the book as well. They've provided direction, which is the D direction. A is alignment, and C is commitment. So for me, I really, really tried really hard. Uh, and I, and as I said, I'm, I'm going through this, and it's tough for me. Even though I know all about the research, it's like, how do you actually implement this stuff? So in terms of direction, it's Here's my vision. Here's where I want the team to go, but actually getting their buy in as well and helping and having them be participative in coming up with that direction. So everybody's bought into that direction. So everybody knows where we're going. So that's the direction part. The A part is alignment. And that's really about role clarity. It's about here is your job and here's what I need you to do. Here are your responsibilities. Here are your roles. And here's everybody else's roles and responsibilities. So everybody knows what's going on and they know what everybody else's role is. And then the C is commitment. How can I get people motivated every day, stay motivated every day? And one of the things I've done to do that is, is what I encourage all new leaders to do. Be proactive. Do it right at the beginning. As soon as you're you know, promoted in the leadership, have these one-on-one -on -one meetings and have, and, and ask each of your direct reports, Hey, where, where do you, where would you like to see our group going so that they can get bought into the direction? Tell them exactly what you think their role is and how important their role is to fulfill the mission of the organization, to um, uh, fulfill the, uh, the goals that we have. Get them bought in to see how exactly their role is important. And then see commitment. Ask, you know, a lot of people, when, they, when, when I talk to them, they say, well, how do I know what motivates people? And, there, and I say, there's a couple of things. One, you can kind of look and see when they're actually kind of in the zone, in the flow, when they're loving life. The type of work that they're in probably clues you in on the motivation they have and what they like to do. But if you don't know, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, that, that's one of the things that I really want leaders to understand. You're, you're not meant to be a mind reader. Mm -hmm. So ask, you know, uh, if you don't have an, an answer to how, you know, how are you uh, showing commitment and what, what makes you motivate? What makes you come to work every day? What do you like about your job or don't like about your job? Ask. I mean, it's such a simple thing, but it's something that we leaders need to do more often. 
Yeah, totally. I have, um, I've written and, and actually done a podcast and a vlog about this, the 10 important conversations every leader should have with every mm. person. And this is one of those 10 that a lot of people just take it for granted. And I want to focus a little bit further into this whole challenge because I know that it's one that I hear about a lot. You know, so, okay, I just went to a barbecue at this person's house, like you just said. And now like yeah. Monday morning, I've just been promoted. And now I'm, you know, like uh, those people suddenly see me as, not trustworthy maybe, or they're mm -hmm. suspicious mm -hmm. of my intentions or, you know, everybody's sort of like unsure how to act. So let's take the example of the person that you were very friendly with, you know, should you yeah. change, should you change how you behave with them? And what should, what should a person do? I have yet to find anything in any organization in their HR rules, you know, to say that once you become a boss, you can no longer be that person's friend. I haven't seen that. Now, there are other things that you probably can or can't do in that supervisory position, but I'm just talking about, you know, still being friends. You know, you were friends before. I mean, and we're at work 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. We're bound to make friends. And mm -hmm. for some of us, we're going to be promoting the leadership. So for those people who are our friends, for, for me, for instance, I had to have that conversation up front with that person really early on. Again, as leaders, we can't be reactive. We have to be proactive. We have to be the ones courageous enough to start out the day to say, hey, these are some things that I have to do. It's going to be a difficult conversation, uh, but hopefully uh, it's going to be one that, that's going to pay off in the end. So for me, I've had to go to several people who I've been friends with before and say, look, you know, I, I'm now leading this team. Um, uh, I know we're friends. I know we have a history. Um, however, in this leadership role that I have, I may have to treat you differently as a direct report reporting relationship than I did before as a peer to peer friend relationship. And if your friend is open enough to understand that, it's going to be, you know, it, it will hopefully turn out well in the end. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, too if you don't have that conversation uh, and People see you as maybe playing favorites. If you give your uh, your friend who, you know, you used to be peers, uh, uh, used to be friends, maybe you still are, and you give that person uh, a higher raise, you give that person more of a spotlight on things, you give that person more um, projects, you might be seen as playing favorites. And when you play favorites, that's when things kind of derail in your career. So being very open and having that proactive conversation first to say, hey, this is how this reporting relationship has to be. What are your thoughts? Get their buy-in. And then also go to people who you might not have as strong as a relationship with. Maybe, again, you were peers, but you didn't really know them. Have that conversation too. And, and again, ask those same questions. What do you like about your job? What do you not like about your job? You know, what motivates you? What can I, what sort of leader are you really looking for, uh, for, for this team to help us move forward? Those are the types of conversations that all new leaders need to have so that everybody's on the same page. Did anything come up in your research about what to do when it's maybe a couple of other people were hoping to get that promotion and now thing they didn't and you did? Or do you have any suggestions for how you can handle yeah. those relationships? That's tough. I mean, I've, I've had that sort of feeling as well. And it's a very difficult subject to talk about because like, you know, it's, it's just a it's just a bad feeling to have sometimes that maybe you took a job that somebody else really wanted. Yeah. However, those people can either make or break you <laughs> with your team, you know? So Again, having that proactive conversation, it, I, I probably would not recommend saying, hey, I heard you wanted this job. I got it. <laughs> but just talking about, you know, um, you know, as the leader of this team, I have sort of a vision of where I want the team to go. But I know that you've, you've been here a while. People respect you. What are some thoughts that you have? You know, getting their buy-in, getting their thoughts and actually implementing them, that can get you on – uh, on your side so that the whole team wins because the last thing you want to do is ostracize anybody as I talk about in the book there's there's kind of our in groups and our out groups and as leaders based on called leader member exchange theory which has been around for decades in the leadership research and theory you need to get as many people in your out group 
in as possible. And we're human. So we all have people who are in our in groups that we treat differently than people in our out groups. But as leaders, it's different. We need to try to get people in our out groups and bring them in as much as possible. And by having those conversations up front, and again, it's not directly just saying, hey, I want to have a conversation you know, between you and me to see why you didn't get the job and, and all that sort of stuff. I wouldn't talk at it from that perspective, but really trying to understand that person's perspective about what his or her strengths are, weaknesses are, what they'd like to do to improve, and how you can use what they have thought um, in terms of where the team is going, in terms of commitment, all those things, to bring them in. It's really about bringing those people in. One of the things that I talk to folks about who are ch- in this kind of a challenge is that you need to also be prepared that it might not be resolved fully with that one conversation. Because if that person is not sure about your motives or is distrustful or even maybe resentful or disappointed, it might take a while and it might take multiple proactive attempts on your behalf until they start either believing you or hear, being able to hear it, or just sort of baby steps beginning to trust you enough to give you information or to go along with you. So don't give up if after doing what you just described as a suggestion, it doesn't magically transform them. I totally agree. And, and trust like Rome isn't built in a day. You've got to do things over and over and over again to help build that trust for that person to say, hey, that person really is in it for me, not for himself or herself, or hey, that person really does care about what I am, am trying to do. So as leaders, we need to you know, build that reputation and it's going to take time and it's going to take many conversations and many actions. And one of the things I talk about in the book too, uh, one of my, my mentors from, from Emory University is named Steve Nowicki. He said there's a there's a cycle in relationships. There's choice, beginning, deepening, and ending. And when you're peer-to-peer and you get promoted in that leadership position, that relationship as you knew it has ended. Yeah. And you need to be prepared to have that relationship. It might be different. Um, it could be for the better, but it could be for the worse. Or that relationship might end, period. You need to be prepared for whatever uh, is going to happen, both with your friends and with your frenemies as well. Mm-hmm. Great advice. Well, thank you so much, Bill. And I really enjoyed talking with you. And I always get disappointed that time is almost running out. So before you give us how to Mm -hmm. get in touch with you and one specific action, what's new and exciting on your horizon these days? One of the things I love about this book is at the end of each of these six flips, you know, mindset, skill set, relationships, do it all attitude, perspective, and focus. Because, you know, new leaders, they many times, as I said in the book, almost 60% of us get no training or development at all. And those that do get way less than senior level executives who have much more years experience being a leader. So at the end of these, uh, at the end of the chapter, there's what I call a coach's corner where um, it asks two questions for you to kind of dig deeper into the into what you learned to really try to implement it and to understand it better. And then two key actions for you to do, like in the next 90 days, make sure you do this. In the next team meeting, make sure you do this. So to really put what you learned into action. And so to, to kind of continue on that, one of the things I'm really wanting to do uh, over the next year or two is come up with new products or new ways for people who don't get the attention, the development dollars, these new leaders, these people on the front lines, what can I do in a very snackable bite? You know, the whole thing is like snackable bite size, you know, in five, 10, 20 minute type things, whether it's a course or a a podcast like this, um, a just in time online toolkit, anything like that. That's what I'm wanting to do is to turn this book content and broaden it out uh, to all sorts of different ways that leaders can digest it, put it into their uh, leadership careers and really shine forth. Because as I said, we don't get enough uh, time and attention. We don't get enough development dollars and we really do deserve it because we're the biggest population of leaders out there and we're the future of, of any sort of success any organization has with their leadership pipeline. So trying to turn this into other ways for leaders to get at it in the palm of their hands in a very cheap, effective, high quality way. That's what I'm going to be doing for the next couple of years. That sounds like an awesome idea. Oh, cool. Well, I, yeah. I can't wait to hear more about what you've, what you've created. That sounds like very, very useful and super needed. So uh, before we wrap up, I always want to leave our listeners with something really actionable that they can do right away, you know, this afternoon, today, this week, that can start to ratchet up their skills to the next level. What would you suggest? 
I end the book with a story about Jack and, and Jack's a good friend of mine here. His, his real name is Jack. <laughs> so I didn't like make his name up. But uh, what he said uh, to me was, was something that really hit home to me. And he didn't just say it to me, he said it to everybody uh, here at work. Every year, right around this time, it's, it's December time, year end, we have these anniversaries uh, that, that come to fruition. And we have kind of like a party to celebrate those milestone anniversaries that happened throughout that previous uh, year. Uh, so last year, um, I had my 10 year anniversary. So I got, you know, to shake the president's hand and they said something really small about me. But Jack, he's been at CCL for 30 years. So oh if you've been here that long, you get to make a speech in front of everybody. Mm. So Jack made a speech and in his speech, it really hit home to me. And that's why I ended in the book with it. And this is what I want to try to encourage all leaders to do. Now, in the speech, Jack said that um, he works in our distribution center. So, for instance, if you order the book, he's the one who pulls the book off the shelf, puts it in a box and ships it off. If you order anything from CCL, he pulls whatever is needed and puts it and packages it up. If we have a program in Mobile, Alabama, he will get all the materials ready, package it up to make sure that the program materials are sent to the uh, program. Yeah. And so he said you know, I will never be able to write a book or stand in front of a, a classroom and train a program. But if I don't do my job, I'm not helping the leaders out there who need our help. So as leaders, what we need to do is to figure out what exactly do our direct reports and our team, what, what do they do to know that they make an impact? So what I leave new leaders with is make sure you tell everybody that you work with how much of an impact they have on your team, on your organization, the impact they have in the world. Have them know that if they don't do their job, something's missing. And if they don't do their job, people are not going to be better at X, Y, or Z, whatever you're, you're, whatever, you know, you're making. So as new leaders, what I want them to do uh, for the next uh, week or so is figure out what is it that each of their direct reports do that makes them indispensable, that makes them special, that makes them know that you know, they make an impact in the world and have that conversation and tell them, you know, if, if the reason why we're so successful is because of what you do and, and do you actually see the impact you're making beyond our, our walls? You know, do you see what you do actually impacts others, our team, our society outside of our walls? If you're able to do that, you're going to be a, a really great leader and people are going to look at you like, wow, that is the boss I want to work for. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want to leave everybody with. Have that conversation with each of the people who report to you and, and ask them, how do you see yourself making an impact on the world for the better? And really have that open conversation. All right. Well, Bill, thank you so much for spending time with us on the Talent Grow Show. We appreciate you. How can people get in touch with you, learn more from you or about you? What would you suggest they do? My website is williamgentryleads.com. My friends call me Bill, but my you know formal name is William, yeah. so williamgentryleads.com. Uh, and I work for the Center for Creative Leadership, so ccl.org. On Twitter, yeah. you can find me at lead underscore better. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for sharing your insights. I know everyone will be a better leader as a result, and you are making the world better. So, Dr. Gentry, I do appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And good luck to everybody out there. All right. Well, you know that if you take action, then you can see results. And if you just go on and do everything the way that you used to, you will not. So make sure you take action based on Dr. Gentry's suggestion. And doesn't it always seem to come down to conversations? I think that there is a theme here. Happy New Year, by the way. This is the first episode of 2017. And I hope that all of us will experience health, happiness, and fulfillment in the new year and beyond. I do have a weekly newsletter that I send out to people who ask to join. And I hope that you're already on that list. But if not, if you grab that free tool that I have on my website for listeners of the podcast called The 10 Mistakes That Leaders Make and How to Avoid Them, then automatically that'll place you on the list and you will get those tips and a uh, link to my latest blog, a link to the latest podcast and other helpful information. It's super fun and short to read and I hope that it's useful. So please get on that list so that we can stay in touch very regularly. I appreciate you listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to send me feedback about how I can make this podcast even better for you. And until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to The Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.